friend Jay, and I'm so happy to be part of the panel. So just to quick, give you a quick introduction, Reshma is uh, she holds a BA in Fine Arts from BITS, as well as her MA from the Institute of Government team, as well as a diploma from the Bharata Natya <laughs> uh, School of Development too, from the Institute of Indian Art and Culture. She uh, currently serves as exhibition coordinator at the Point of Order, an experimental exhibition space run by the Division of Visual Arts at BITS. And Dr. Charlene Khan holds a PhD from uh, Goldsmith University in London. And uh, she's exhibited widely locally and internationally. And uh, in 2015, she was awarded the second prize in the Brendan Peter Kunji Prize for the production of her video with the moon waxes red. And the video is in the um, it's on exhibition in the gallery. Uh, she's currently a senior lecturer in art history and visual culture at Rhodes University. So the first presentation we have with uh, Reshma and then Shami chair the panel right after. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to, just for less than 10 minutes, talk to you about the framing of the exhibition as a whole. Um, because they are three separate bodies of work produced by uh, three artists. And so uh, part of the rationale for why we've come together. Um, and uh, so uh, Jora, she's a film scholar and a filmmaker. And this is his kind of his first foray into visual arts as such. Um, for me, it's uh, a, a very personal exhibition. Uh, I'm not showing any images and stuff because I think I'm supposed to have a walkabout of the exhibition uh, after this. So I don't want it to be boring for anybody who's coming for the exhibition. So, so, so Reshma will present on her work. Um, and so, uh, Jodesh and myself, um, Jodesh is a writer, I'm a writer, and so we've, we've had uh, connections over the last few years where Jodesh has interviewed me about my work and written about my work. Um, I've written about Reshma's work, and then I have now written on Jodesh's work, and Jodesh is also writing on Reshma's work. So it actually started off via that kind of, of uh, interaction where we were actually interested um, as writers in each other's works and the kind of intellectual discourse. And part of that is because of the lack of intellectual discourses around Indian artists and what that means to be an Indian artist. Um, this kind of huge diasporic term of being Indian. Um, Reshma comes from Johannesburg, in, uh, Benoni in Johannesburg. I come from Durban. Jorish comes from Stanger, and already those are three very different identities, even within the South African context. So, um, someone like me from Durban would mock people from Stanger, <laughs> and uh, um, there's also, you know, issues between various, uh, you know, Durban Indians, Joburg Indians, and the kinds of uh, accents we have, and you know, Durban's mock the way. Joe Burgers say nah, nah at the end of everything. Um, and so we each produced these bodies of work and then decided to um, actually bring them together to start exhibiting as a group. And part of that was the rationale that um, w w there's a lot of commonalities in the three bodies of work. There's also a lot of differences. Um, and so to actually create a uh, uh, in South African Indian discourses uh, in the visual arts that are much more heterogeneous, that are much more complex, contradictory, and ambiguous. Um, we, we're often stuck with, you know, the, the stereotypes of samosas, and saris, and cricket, and Gandhi's, Kamsutra, Gupta. And so how do you make work that doesn't just reflect those stereotypes? How do you make work that discusses those kinds of stereotypes, but not in an exotic way? Um, I mean, the Kama Sutra is still pretty exotic for us as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, we start with, we have, this is the third uh, time we've exhibited together. We've held it at the KZNSA previously. We've held it at Point of Order in Johannesburg, and now it's here. Um, and some of the commonalities are around memory, around sexuality, around private and public violences. And so 
uh, the title Remembering is influenced by this bell hooks idea of uh, what it means to remember, right? And remembering as a kind of a bodily act to remember, to put together different parts into a whole. Um, sometimes I like to think of that as a kind of a Frankensteinian whole. Um, I kind of like my monsters. <laughs> and uh, so this exhibition is about bodies. You'll find uh, one of the common threads is all of us using our bodies um, as the basis from which our critiques are located, our very personal critiques are located. But it's not necessarily about an Indian critique. Uh, it starts off from the location of an Indian body in South Africa uh, and the various ways in which our families have come to, become, to be in South Africa. So those of you who don't know, uh, perhaps um, you know, Indians have been in, in, in South Africa since at least um, uh, some of the first waves of migration in the Cape. Uh, but the most major uh, migration was in the 1860s, uh, the second half of the 19th century, by the British indentured labor system. So in the demise of slavery, the new economic model that the British favored was then the indentured labor system. So for seven years, uh, very poor Indians were promised uh, work uh, in South Africa. The stories range to things like streets of gold and things like that. Um, uh, my my uh, one, one set of my grandparents came over because they were escaping arranged marriages, and so they my. One of my great grandmothers basically took all her wedding gifts, got onto the ship, and eloped with my my grandfather. So it's it's that interesting mix of uh, a historical phenomenon that is indentured labor, um, with personal stories of people migrating for whatever reasons that they are, um, and so these indentured narratives are also about migrations and the ways in which migrations affect bodies so differently. Uh, in my work, particularly around women and around how women carry the burdens of recreating families together, recreating homes, what it means to be dislocated from family ties, um, and the kinds of violences that that brings as well. Uh, uh, also in terms of, you know, in the colonial system. So it's the colonial system that moves Indians from India over to South Africa, and then the Indian South Africans are then placed under another colonial system of also the Dutch, and then apartheid, and that being then placed in that hierarchical system as well. So what does it mean um, for all of these historical factors to impinge not just on your social and your collective identities, but how does it seep into your personal space? How does how your colonial master treat you in the plantation, how, uh, how does that seep into family violences? What does it mean to be an incre to incredibly poor family? And that was why, why I created my body of work was that uh, growing up in spaces like Phoenix and Newlands and uh, people from Chatsworth, the people that I grew up with were not rich Indians. They were not necessarily even working class. They were an underclass community. And so we had people next door dying from hunger and poverty. And yet the narratives on TV were of the Indian shopkeeper and uh, the middle class strata that was involved in the, in, in the anti-apartheid struggle. They were not narratives about the poor underclass of the Indian, South African Indian community and how those factors of colonialism and apartheid were continuing generationally to affect us as a community and as individual families as well. Um, and so it was to try to tell that story because those stories still don't really exist in, 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 in kind of a visual medium. We do have writers who are engaging them, but they tend to be very sentimental. I mean, it's not if you can recognize that, right? That sentimentality about your community when you're a minority community at times, like you feel like you don't want to betray your community by saying things. And, and in a way, we're all kind of betraying our community by tackling patriarchy within our community, by tackling conservative act attitudes towards sexuality, uh, issues of class difference, uh, 
issues of, of gender violence. Um, and so um, I think that betrayal is quite important, but it's also important how you negotiate these inside, outsider, outside, inside relationships like Trinity Minha, the, the Vietnamese uh, filmmaker discusses. What are, the, what are the obligations you have when you come from that community of people to portray their stories because you're accountable to them? But when it's your own family, even more so, how do you tell secrets that you're not supposed to tell? But in a way that is empowering for a larger set of, of people. So when I out my stepfather and I out my father, it's not done out of vengeance, but it's acknowledging that patriarchy right within my own family space. And one of the things I found with my exhibition is how people across the world have connected with it. So it doesn't matter whether it's been in Greece or it's been in Germany. I've literally had men and women come and cry. They often come to hug me. And I'm not entirely sure they're hugging me. I think they need the hug. <laughs> because I think in the, in the tales we don't tell to each other is the family violences we all grow up with, right? Um, with all of the discourses we have at spaces like the university, in the university, how often do we get to tell about those very personal hurts that we have? How often do we get to say that we are a victim of this and this and this and this? Where's the space in our university discourses to speak about love, to speak about people that abuse you? And so um, this is also why we're taking it around to university spaces as well and to other kinds of spaces, because it is these, these discourses are important. Um, you know, if, if I, I always tell in my art history class, if the Fast and the Furious uh, is making a billion dollars, it's not something you can ignore if you teach visual culture. If most of our industry, popular industry, is, is obsessed with love, finding love, getting love, keeping love, losing love, um, how to fuck somebody, why are we not talking about these in our classrooms when these impact? on our students and on ourselves every single day. So in a way, I mean, the buzzword is a lot about decoloniality, um, but there is this trajectory of people like Balcos and Mignolos and stuff who are speaking about what it means to, to have decolonial love. And de part of decolonial love is also looking at how the impact of colonization on our private spaces on our private emotions, on our private selves. And so this exhibition does deal with um, these different bodies of work. And when we say bodies of work, it is artwork that is extending from our bodies. It's locating our bodies uh, at the particular juncture that it, that it is. Um, and, and, um, but certainly not reduced to its Indianness. Um, yeah, I, I think as you go through the exhibition, I think people start identifying their own family histories in it. I think they start finding issues around sexuality, um, around, se uh, around sex in itself, around women's empowerment, uh, around public and private violences, uh, around resistances and agencies, and um, that they can identify within their own own lives and their own communities. And so it is to have used that kind of geo-specific location of our bodies, but to have larger, wider, more complicated discourses with other South Africans as a starting point and people internationally who are still constantly affected by, by migration. Um, the, that period is not ended, it just takes different forms. So I'm going to hand over to Reshma, she's going to give us a presentation upon our work, and then uh, Namusa and Jay are going to respond to some of these ideas. Hi, um, so I'm going to present, uh, I've been presenting an essay from a talk from a book, uh, which I co-edited with Montevico and Mandela. Uh, and the book is really a reflective project on our exhibition, The Two Talking Yogis. But it's also a moment for us to think about a recuration of the work in a book format. So that's forthcoming if we have money. To print. <laughs> okay. The Absent Yogi, Conversations with Ajma. This is where the conversation begins. 
She is the starting point. My late maternal grandmother, Devi Prashodhan, maiden name Shiva. This is, of course, a coincidence. She, who traveled around 1950 with her seven year old son by ship from Gujarat, India to East Africa, and finally took a train ride down to South Africa from Mozambique, was a woman who overcame great difficulty in a foreign land. She, who spoke a foreign tongue and battled patriarchal systems within her home and within the broader South African context, yet all the while embodied the innate strength, beauty, and power of the goddess, something many around her would witness. She was a young woman in her 20s, her exact age unknown, and suddenly had to assimilate to another culture, space, way of being, and to a life she probably never imagined for herself. To me, my Ajima was an embodiment of the Hindu goddess Kali, Devi, Kali, and Ajima are In this presentation, I reflect on how my Ajima informs my practice. Years after her passing, I probed a conversation with her. This imagined conversation with her, the absent yogi, the original yogi, started in 2003. I asked, what is it that draws me to this space of engagement with, with that which cannot be attained? And how do I do it? It is ongoing. Ajima and Kali both arrived in my space around the same time. But perhaps it was Ajima who arrived first. And it is her arrival that invoked the sudden presence of Kali as a being of female defiance within my artistic production. Their joint arrival cannot be coincidental. They are simultaneous. The first time I came across Kali was in the form of Padra Kali, as described in the writings of Sarah Fowler in her book, O Terrifying Mother, Sexuality, Violence, and the Worship of Goddess Kali. And as much as this book is what I would describe as the position of an outsider, that is, someone who does not come from the space where Kali, in which Kali is worshipped or embodied, it is nonetheless my way to her, to them. The more I learned about the goddess, the more I felt the presence of Ajima, not in the sense of her physically being in my space, but rather that the embodiment of the Kali was present in the life of my grandmother. I learned about my grandmother's life through conversations with my mother. The more I dug into her life through my mother, the more I realized the innate power of the woman of this generation. And while the story of her life is, not spe is specific to her journey and ancestry, her story of, pow of, of power and ability to overcome is not outside of the context of being women, of fighting patriarchy, of gender, of ethnicity, of race. my conversations with Ajima, I realized that her pushback was towards more than just the survival of a spot of space. The choice to speak languages that were both of this context and not, Panagaro and Gujarati, but with the purposeful rejection of the colonial tongue or language, was her very first act of defiance. It is in the unpacking of her life that I learn about the unfairness of patriarchal community, particularly the South African Indian community. It was in the anger that arose during this digging that I realized that Kali was undoubtedly personified through my grandmother. This personification enforces her ability to take economic ownership of her survival rather than simply endure. Instead, not only did she take economic power by choosing to sell a child of circumstance from home, but she also took charge of running the monthly budget in her home. Defiance, again. And like a great motherly goddess, she lived a life of making big, many children. And like many women of her generation, she did this alone. Ajima's generation lived by the principle that women stayed at home to raise the kids and look after the home, while men went out to work and be the financial providers. In this sense, she single-handedly raised her kids, yet was always tied to patriarchy, always tied to expectation. Yet she did it in a way that would make big a trail of female warriors with her shadow of more times to come, again, defiance, again. The embodiment of the Kali is more complex. It is not simply about pushing against the system in aggressive ways. It is the ability to overcome, to transform, to move beyond the space of difficulty. This I see in so many, in so many of the women in my life. I encounter these stories 
in so many conversations. Kali is usually seen as the embodiment of the wild, untamed side of nature. She is most often represented as semi-naked and wears a girdle of human arms, a necklace of human skulls or heads. Her hair is unbound and disheveled. Her outstretched tongue drops with blood, evident of her aggressive temperament and suggestive of her erotic sexuality as a goddess. In various depictions, her hand, many hands are shown to hold some of the following. A severed demonic head, a pot of blood, swords, daggers, scissors, and numerous other weapons. At other times, she is also shown with a gesture of other protection, a gesture shown by most Hindu deities. To me, Kali is in every lived moment. She is both in the light and the dark, the moments of defiance and acceptance. She is the ability to transform, to exist in spaces of duality and non-duality. She is both the ferociousness of a mother protecting her child and the defiant roar of a woman walking down the street in the platform. She is both without fear and of fear itself. She has the ability to choose outside of societal expectations while still able to operate meaningfully in those spaces, just like Adina. She is the ability to constantly overcome and stand naked and vulnerable through battle and yet still be beautiful in her unbridledness, her unconvention, her deviance. She is without ancestry and simultaneously of it. She is Indian in her blackness and black in her Indianness. She is the intersection, <coughs> intersectionality. Yoni. Outside of simply using iconography taken from the image of Kali, a shift occurred in my production when I encountered writing on the, the, on the Yoni of Mumba as a space of sacredness and innate feminine power. Ajit Mukherjee, in his book Kali, The Feminine Force, points out that the yoni is extolled as a sacred area, the transmission point for subtle forces, the gateway to cosmic mysteries. It was this notion of the subtle power of the yoni that became the starting point of the Two Talking Yonis project, which was exhibited in 2013 in Johannesburg. I had envisioned a space that was an all consuming, overpowering space of containment that resembled a cavity of some sort and could be likened to a yoni or a vaginal passage or womb. But the yoni was more than just the sacred area. It was multi-layered, it was personal, it was political, it was defiant. It addressed my interest in goddess energy and the spiritual power believed to be stored and worked from the vagina. It was site-specific and thus intended to be political as well, housed in the former women's jail. The vagina in this context aimed to give these women, that is, former prisoners, albeit in their absence, the power and agency to reclaim this space as one of protest. The exhibition also addressed the placement of me, either as Bali or as Reshma, the talking yogi, the artist within this space. It was also my decision to invite Dr. Vekon Kapila to curate the exhibition that brought my positionality and my politics to the forefront. Through through the many conversations, disagreements, and agreements with this collaborator, this sounding board, the other yoni of the two talking yonis, my, my work was able to move beyond simply the aesthetic or aesthetics of the yonis. The space of the prison also spoke back to Ajima. I asked, were patriarchal homes not another form, another type of prison in themselves? Were the women of this generation not quietly accepting yet inwardly finding strength to push against the very system that they enabled. All I know is that it must have taken great courage and strength to accept, without choice, the life that they lived. And it is in those moments that the muted role of the Kali is enacted. Red, black. This is the first color I associate with Kali, simply because the word Kali itself means black. But it is red, redness, fierceness, bloodiness, that I see in my mind when I imagine her. She is the one who laps the blood of the demon Raktavija that finally ensures his demise. She is the one who in bloodthirst can only be appeased by her male counterpart Shiva, and then too, he has to take the position of the submissive and lie under her strangling body while she satiates herself, her desire, her thirst. She is the passion of red. She is the death and reborn of menstrual blood as it leaves the body only to rejuvenate for possible birth month after month, year after year, transformation.
varying shades of grey in my work speak to the varying moments of karma, of amusement from nurturing mother to ferocious killer. Unlike Ajinato, who I associate with the color beige or white. The supposed color of the widow, according to Hindu custom. Kali is never without things. But this does not mean that Ajima is without power. Ajima, or Devi, my name, is after all Shak, primordial power, the power that lies within us all. In conforming to that which she understood best, she chose the color white or beige. Yet she still moved through the world with dignity, power, and respect. Even after becoming a widow, she was still the sounding board, the elder in the community, the guidance that every woman sought, and the mother that every man elected for advice. People still speak her name today. I am born. Trained in the dance, in the classical dance style of Haripanatya, and as a visual artist with a keen interest in the secrets of Hindu mythology. My art making aims to disrupt conventional notions of being a woman of Indian ancestry in contemporary South Africa. Through obsessive encounters with the goddess Kali, the unbridled, provocative, and ferocious goddess of time, my work draws on aspects of sexuality and identity as understood through Kali's embodiment, embodiment of female defiance and aggression, her outstretched tongue, plus, out, outstretched bloodstained tongue, her yoni or vulva, her dark volumes of wild hair and her performative defiance to the camera become the core motifs of the language of my work. Through an exploration of Bharatanatyam mind, there is penetration into the surfaces of saris and canvases, and a mixture of non-traditional painting media, including kumkum, turmeric, crushed coal, and ash, I draw on the signs and symbols of bodies, destruction, aggression, to create female identities of defiance and revolt. I aim to blur the line of the mythological or the real, the feminine or the masculine, Indian or black, performed or painted, transcendent or physical. To me, my work enters the battleground of negotiating my Indianness, my femininity, my sexuality as aspects of my identity, and aims to dismantle conventions of art making, expectations of Indian womanhood, and patriarchal systems that are particular to my experience. Conversations. As I stood at the door of the woman's jail in August 2013, I felt my ajima take me by the hand and guide me through his name. The manifestation of the two coherence. She quietly allowed me to feel her presence of feel the presence of the Kali through her guidance. The original yogi was present in this space. Without Ajima, I would not be here today, both literally and figuratively. Without her, I would not have encountered Kali, which in turn led me to the text on the secrets of yoni power. Without her, there would be no talking yoni. And I would have never found the defiant spirit that led to arguments with Mundo about race, gender, politics, and positionality. And suddenly, without trace or warning, after the chaos around the exhibition had subsided, I felt my ajimari and transcend to another space, a space that is certainly unattainable to me now. But then I looked around me and I realized she actually left me amongst the other ladies, the other collaborators who will be on this journey with me. These many yogis, many collaborators, many sounding boards, and women who already embrace and embody the Kali, who will surely be future collaborators and reminders of the very first conversation, the very first year with my <laughs> Nature of narrative. Mm -hmm. So, in telling the stories and in telling the, the 
the experiences, personal experiences, they begin to overcome the, the predominant narrative or the perceptions that there are about particular narratives in Spain and in, especially in South Africa. And so I think even the motif of the tongue, um, the tongue is something that could be touched, that could be trampled on, that could be, you know, something that could be stitched. Um, one begins to sort of think about it in, in much more metaphorical ways. So the tongue as the subversive tool and something that can begin to, you know, not only tells narratives, but also becomes a sort of violent tool, like the bloody tongue of um, Heidi. Um, so through those motifs, I think also in your narratives, right, your personal narratives, the, the you know the telling of pain, the telling of trauma, the telling of moving, you know, the trauma that comes with moving or migration. Um, you know, not only is it, you know, one doesn't necessarily think about the tongue, but also the silences. So the stories that have been silenced and sort of the muffling of the tongue. I mean, those are sort of some of the motives that I thought could really begin the conversation with, and perhaps move to, you know, maybe hear from James and Francis and then we'll come back to it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's good. I think mean, it's um, the exhibition and then your, your, your presentations. I've talked to a very, very large subject for me, and the, the you know, so the the idea of um, of Indianness um, in particular, and especially at this time um, in this country right now, and also you know, uh, you know, for me politically, it's quite an interesting time for for with regards to Indianness, and um, especially what's happening. For so in the towel right now, and it has, it's not that it's just suddenly come about because it has revealed itself over many, many years. And I think what you pointed out, which is really interesting, Charlene, is this uh, a complete, uh, you know, fair amount of ignorance around um, the, uh, what you're calling the underclass. And I think it's that, that, uh, that understanding how the you know, the apartheid system was about positing underclass with underclass mm -hmm. and then developing these kind of really strict uh, and, and taught differences um, and then to continue that. But I think that there's another kind of um, myth that I've struggled with. Uh, you know, I was in a talk in Venice now and there was, a, there was an artist from, a curator, artist curator, Arjun from, from Delhi. And, uh, and uh, the person that was chairing and said, you know, there's another, you know, and another, we have two Indians on the panel. And, and then I said, I'm not an Indian. I'm, <laughs> I, you know, I'm an African and I am, I, if, at the, you know, the closest I didn't identify is as a black South African. And I've never really understood myself as an Indian. And it is, it, it is a very, um, it's a bit, you know, it's something that also happened in my family because my father was both, uh, you know, the, one of the architects of the sports boycott, and he was, a, you know, he was a, a pan Africanist, but he was also the the, the chair of the Ta Natal Tamil Vedic Society, which was the promoter of Sivism, which is a particular brand of Hinduism, the very radical. Kind of Tamil Tigers think Tamil Tigers, and that was my problem, right? So, so he, uh, you know, so, so he, but but, the, but it was a paradox because he was both a staunch Tamilian, but he was also promoting a kind of a pan Africanism uh, in, as, a, as, a, as a politician. And I've kind of stayed with that kind of paradox a lot of the time, and that, you know, how, but, but being introduced as an, as an Indian, you know, kind of really made me recall, like, and I just really, you know, I didn't have a reaction, and I did wonder whether I needed some therapy to go <laughs> up, and I've got some issues about being, uh, uh, but I mean, it's just because, I, you know, my, you know, we, of course I grew up with Indian character, I mean, I don't know whether that's how Indian that is, but, um, but so I think that there's also these myths that um, that the Indian community in South Africa perpetuate as well, you know, about certain kind of exotic art. Uh, and, uh, you know, India does that. You know, India sort of survived years and years in current fashions of, of the nth degree.
three or eight. So the this is close to Donald Trump as you know, uh, uh, you know and, and they've hidden behind a kind of exotic how Indians have lived under a kind of you know you can't touch Indians because there's something spiritual and mythological and Aryan. And, and, Aryan. and Aryan. Exactly. And so so I think that there you know so there are quite a few interesting kinds of layers around of myths and betrayals about what Indianness is about. And then and, and then sometimes I also am thinking of myself as, as a black South African, I wonder whether, you know, in my later years, of course it was very comfortable for me in, in my 20s and 30s, but in my later years, if you don't know, in my later years, I wonder whether it's a kind of a trying to get, you know, being labeled as getting the best of both worlds as well. Having the allure and whatever of Indianness and then retaining a kind of a blackness in this in this moment, in this time. So it's it's quite complex and and you know and I think you, your your exhibition and then also the reference to Kali and uh, my mother gets Kali chance as well into the mix. You know, and so she she's uh, she 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 has to she has to do a lot of work to not get that Kali chance anymore because she you know she didn't want to. Um, but but you know the, so the, 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 you know it is it is it is incredibly complex and I found that the exhibition and especially uh, touching on, on queerness and knowing about uh, how how hidden queerness is inside of, of the, the again the so-called Indian community and probably you know, um, you know, and my own kind of coming out on national television with the with the, and what what that that click that was from the Indian community all you know it's it is yeah the the, the it exhibition was. it was kick back. Yeah I mean there was there was this I think the the boldness with which I had I didn't confess anything I was in production and uh, <laughs> it came to form it and um, and in it I was called a homosexuals out in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they did a they did a film of it, and uh, it was I don't know how you know I was old enough to know it. <laughs> it was on Grab Grab TV or something. It was, uh, at six o'clock, it was flighted, and um, yeah, and then I, I had all these phone calls, and it was really interesting because my sister-in-law was crying for help, and she called me. She said, "I, mean, I really support you," and I tell you know, told her, "There's nothing to support you." So yeah, and I, yeah, so there was a bit, I think that I think there, there is a sense of letting the side down on some level. Uh, so there is there is all that range is going to just say that the exhibition raises a whole range of different nuances around uh, and for me particularly around blackness and Point with the two of your ideas, um, uh, which, if, if, if there is anybody staying for the walk about, we will be we'll discussing more detail in the individual body as well. But around uh, the, the silences, um, it, because Jordan Jordan has no coming out story, you know, um, uh, he, his family kind of guessed this. They know, so there was no direct coming out. Uh, um, but is this something nobody speaks about? And so you know, he tries to look into the archive and see and sees these images of just men standing next to each other, and in that space in between, in that silence and in the gap, he reads these kinds of intimacies into these in, into these images, um, which I, I I found very powerful, you know, and and going back to what you were saying, because I I use the the black feminist of um, Audre Lorde's idea of biomythography. And so, biomythography is about um, is about the fact that that even right now, all of y'all are hearing me saying the exact same thing. But if you were taking notes, all of you would have entirely different things. And so, if we were asked to recount this, everybody would have a different idea of what was said, and none of that disqualifies the other. So, instead of trying to get at a truth from all of that. It's about accepting these multiple truths and spaces and silences and gaps in between that creates the biomythography. 
So instead of trying to get at a singular truth, it's about getting texture narrativization. And what that texture does in terms of complications and contradictions and ambiguities. And, and, and I love also that you picked up on the whole thing of tongue as well, because again, you know, looking at sort of Latina feminists and someone like Gloria and Santura talking about the, the flaming tongue and the forked tongue. Um, and this idea that we live these multiple identities uh, you know, in various spaces, you're, you're different people all at the same time, and which time comes to the fore mm. and when. So, I mean, it's fantastic that you, you, know, you were able to pick up on this kind of those black feminist strategies that all of us, including Jordan, <laughs> you know, uses in all of our work. I think it's interesting that you've raised uh, this, this question of being both Indian and black. Mm. And I think that's this. There's something quite interesting about how in in you know the exhibition, the very notion of sexuality, the very notion of gender, the very notion of race is 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 unsettled, right? So I mean I think so you know it's this I guess I identify with Indian race, but I'm not a black South African. But also in terms of gender, when you think about gods and goddesses. There's such a playful nature in which you know the, the idea of gender switches, but you know can never be stable. It's always sort of volatile. And this is my thing about also with like fundamental sort of truths when you think of communities uh, and, and religion is that there is there is such gender fluidity mm -hmm. in, for example, the invocation of Shiva. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and the lingam and the yoni uh, mm -hmm. living together. I mean, people have been worshipping this dick for <laughs> 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 They refuse to acknowledge that it's a dick, you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, and you know, and that there's the, the shiva lingam, you know, is a, is a dick, and, you know, and, it, and, the, and they've, they've kind of like really drained all the sexuality out of it and made it into this thing um, which I think is the is the real um, the, the, what the priests really wanted was to you know, drain, drain all that. But but I, you know that Shiva is also this sort that the fluidity and I, and so I also I it, it does continually trouble me and, and, and confuse me about the lack of fluidity of our race and color in um, you know because it is a very you know. You think about think about the caste system and you know the color and color of skins in India and the North and the Aryan and the influence of the Aryan. Um, it's it's just I mean it's it's it, there's, there's just so many contradictions. In there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it, uh, I've never understood that kind of fundamental approach to race and gender when the content has so much else to offer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, thanks so much for the presentation and your work and the, the discussion's responses. Um, I appreciate many things about it, uh, especially the kind of very challenging uh, problems that it poses because you know, I want to know and I need us to, to, to engage in, in such a depth because the kind of um, clarification that I need from the stories that you can the mythology of South Africa invention of stories and oblivion. So, so there's almost like two collections, the kind of visual, and then the, the more textual and verbal and words, also in the way of music. So even using Indian, Indian as the gender, I, what the Shina you know, uh, did, did we arrive at this invitation uh, through some guidance with Kali? But how is Kali a self-standing emotion First gender, not the body to the picture, because how do we not do what Nitesh Chakravarti is, you know, at least hoping to say, provincialize Europe, go to the teleological offshoot of European modernity, including the words, the English, the gender, the patriarchy. Um, so, because the visual has more, has the decolonial space in it, however, if we continue to re-essentiate the textual, then we have colonized that decolonial 
possibility with the possibility of the option, the cloning option there as many of those things. So I think it's a challenge simply also like in some ways to get you started and, and clarify something about uh, regions costs because it's also a bit the bogus thing. You spoof some people from here, they will have adopted in South Africa and apparently it's something it's bogus. These things are the, the so the scholars are but also related and at least on the work. But the Indian scholars who miss our ultimate study scholars who recovered a lot of history pieces, especially like Jena, Pramila Tapa, who have shown you know, the kind of bogus formations of the ism. So when we mean Hinduism, which I don't hear much here, but I hear Indian, uh, it's you know that's one really known sort of uh, about connotation. But even that, and when we speak about Modi, we have to speak about Brahmanism and then really Brahmanism. And then Saivism and Shaktism, you know, these different, and the ism is also the problem. I think people understand the ism, it's not an emic linguistic thing, it's an imposed, which means colonial. So we get into the trap of, you know, the divided town, but it's a not a demon town, to, you know, I'm going to ask more as, you could maybe find it anyway, which is, you know, rather much, it's just, you know, wonderful, and wonderfully soft and wonderfully hard. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm just holding that thing. It's more of like just saying, I like what we're all doing in our space, and that, especially in this political time, what we need. It's getting not funny as the word. It's getting so urgent for us to go and think outside the given category, the imposed category, the racist story, the nationalism stories, ethnic nationalism, ethnic chauvinism, that kind of thing. Because then forever leaves us outside thinking my Indianness and my blackness, you know, this kind of like gets this tendency. It's, it's there is still in like a postmodern rush of the thing, which is again you know, needing to be like backtracked a bit because like and so the words were you know borderland is such a rich text to 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 go back to and uh, then to hold my back and all these things about the chaos because that's what actually is the silent space between these two men. So I am I'm queer. I have to I have to like just you know I see two men with the proximity of them holding hands. So I think they're gay but I have to try to understand what it is like for for them not that's my reality, that's my cosmology. Uh, so, so it's when I watch uh, Sanjay Lila Bansali's uh, Ram Lila or um, the Jonathan um, Ivani Masan, that kind of thing. It's always very really <coughs> queer. And then I have to, like, thank you, I've worked hard enough to, to have a queer consciousness and queer cosmology. And so I have to retranslate myself and be like, oh, okay, there's this great possibility. But for me, the first thing. I just want to say one very quickly so that in terms of um, uh, between the visuality and text and textuality, uh, we, we, while we are using the words patriarchy and stuff like that, and we are saying this in English, we, we must also not be careful of not reducing these things to just a colonial import, because we have had gender equalities in our communities uh, throughout the world. And so uh, we've chosen to, to use the word patriarchy because uh, feminisms across the world um, are, are using that word patriarchy. How it manifests pre-colonially uh, we can have those discussions, uh, but certainly there have been strains and there's lots of work as well about the gender equalities uh, pre-colonially in our societies. Um, and also some of the things, I mean, one of the reasons that they do not share the isms of the, of, the, of the Indian variety here is that I'm very cautious. I come from, a, from my mother was Tamil, but she converted to Christianity. My father was Muslim. So for me, the, the Hindu narrative is not a dominant one. Um, it's it's uh, when I was first year at university, the, the the lecturer looked at my stuff and she says, "Well, why why are you doing this kind of work? Well, you know, you have a whole pantheon of Hindu gods to work with." Like, I can say no because I didn't grow up with the Hindu religion, and so 
And so it's also not to, to, to let Hinduism also dominate these kind of very vast discourses that, that we are all engaging in within South Africa. Um, for me also, I think it's, it's more about the narrative that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the mythologies and how do we destabilize these mythologies as well? How do we look at, say, Sita or Draupadi from a feminist place instead of her, her, those, those terrifying stories of what actually happened to them? Um, so for me, it's really about that as a starting point as opposed to it sitting in Hinduism. Yes, it may come from that space, but it is about the story. And it's about Kote. You know, yeah. um, and I'm interested in that both in in my practice as a visual artist and a dancer. And how do we uh, dismantle these stories as well? How do we retell them? How do they have relevance now in this place, in the context, in the time? Uh, but I also just want to say something about the Indian and Black. Um, there's a very real um, effect or effect that it has. Um, and I I don't know, Jake. Maybe it's a generational thing, but for me. Whites did not picture. Black people did not picture. When we stayed, stayed it in Johannesburg, there was a wonderful, huge multiracial audience. When we stayed it here, there were seven people who came for the opening. And at seven, out of the seven people, five people were my friends who are not in the arts. <laughs> uh, so, so, so we also see the kinds of dynamics there. You know, Jordan, she's also quite affected by it because he, he, he can't understand if anytime else there's gay stuff, people are protesting. Why is nobody protesting out of outside his work? There's so many there's so many things on this clip. Why is nobody protesting? Um, and so so it's also exposing the kind of South African Africanness discourses as well, right? Because there's the there's the space of the black and the space of the white and the in-between space is the colored space. So there isn't any space for the South African Indian and the South African Chinese and and, and South African Africans from different ancestries. So it really is also about questioning the kinds of, um, of dominations that there is and, and this constant struggle. Um, I mean, I, I don't necessarily feel my Africanness is a struggle, but it's constantly pointed out at me. And so you can, you're never 100% able to, to feel at home, even though you feel at home if you understand the contradiction. Uh, you're, 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 you're been here 160 years or however many years now, and then suddenly something on Facebook comes up and reminds you, you don't belong. And it's like, but if I don't belong here, then where do I belong? I don't speak any Indian languages. Uh, I speak Afrikaans and English, and I don't even speak Afrikaans that well. So like, you know, I speak German English. You hear it in the accents. We have like a whole cow down there. Um, so, so, it, it's 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 also this global issues of migration at, at which point do you become homed in a place? How can you constantly through generations be unhomed and, and why are you so precarious as well? I mean, I mean there's just always some indifference to what you you said. It is it, you know, I think to see an older I mean it's it's a work. It's, you know, one is I don't think I don't know whether anybody kind of like falls back in this layer, I mean, probably with the exception of, you know, white people at a certain particular time. I don't know whether anybody falls back on a, on a, you know, in a kind of covered top identity. I think it's it's constant work. I mean, that's what I, and I mean, that's why my, my construction of, I'm not constructing my, my sense of blackness is, is that it is every single day. It is, it's 
it's work. You know, it is work. And it's not, you know, it's not the, that I, you know, and, I, and, I, and it's almost like I wouldn't want to think of the work. And I, and I do understand the exclusions to, to, to do the rise, but I always wouldn't want it any other way. Because I do think that, you know, one has to keep constructing because every moment is a, a challenge to, you know, a betrayal. Every moment is a potential for a betrayal and a challenge. Yeah. But there's a flattening of race in South Africa that I think, you know, struggle with. And so I was struggling with that. Whenever we think of the category black, we think of one thing or one thing only. And I think that's problematic because we've lived through a history where it's meant so many things. So, and we're all struggling with it, right? And it's, so it's not only the sense of being Indian, I think, thinking about black, but also I think middle class black mm. or black African mm. also question am I doing the black thing? So there's a, there's a flattening of race that I think. Is, is beautifully raised, but obviously with a focus on the on, on Indian identity in South Africa. But one that sort of, you know, it, that sort of brings us, that brings out these flattened ideas of identity through the use of the archival material and photographs. And once you start looking at historical photographs, and you start thinking, even back then, these things never really solidified. These ideas from the beginning never really solidified. So why do we think of them as such solid rather than you know, a word now fluid, mm -hmm. so fluid ways? Um, so I think in the exhibition generally, one begins to once you start delving into those narratives, you begin to think, you know, if, if, if this experience happened this way, then surely all of these things that we think can't be questioned, are very questionable. Right? And all the things we think we know about ourselves, we think we know about our communities, are very questionable. So I think there's something, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's something that's quite nice. And, and listening to, to the narrative, the video, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that work, uh, I mean, the, this, the, all the work in the, the exhibition is, is really uh, you know, poignant, but you know, you, you start to sort of delve into the, the narrative, you start to delve into the story, and you think, I can never settle at this one point in terms of identity if I can think this was the story of someone who lived all those years ago, and this is the experience of that person after being unhomed, after finding home, after making home, you know, and, and, and trying to figure out where do I fit in. So, but you're right, this work. Okay, great. And on that point, thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any further questions, I mean, they can carry on uh, during the walk about it. We'll have now Shalini and Rashna, and it's been lovely. Thank you, and uh, thank you. Everyone.